And it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Lisa Cooley, who is an astronomist and astrophysicist. So changing topics again. Um, Lisa is the director of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and the director of the Harvard College Observatory and professor of astrophysics at the Harvard Department of Astronomy. Previously, she was the director of the Australian or IRC Center of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics in 3D um, here at the ANU. And since July 2022, she's gone off to Harvard um, doing great big things she hopefully tells us about. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. I'll just wait till my slides come up. Or maybe I need to. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about astronomy and astrophysics and the needs for exascale computing. In particular, I'm going to focus a little bit on what we're doing worldwide and uh, some of the experiments we're doing at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And then I'm going to talk more about Australian needs and uh, work that we were leading into in our Center of Excellence uh, for All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions, Astro 3D. So just to start with, it's it's a fantastic time to be alive in astronomy at the moment and let's see I think the batteries might be running a bit flat so this slide here shows you what we're what we're gonna what's gonna happen in astronomy over the coming uh, decade or decade and a half and we're actually gonna have a revolution in astronomy over the coming years and what's gonna happen is we're gonna be making tremendous amounts of discoveries over this time period uh, in the past, whenever we made a major leap in telescope size, so for example, when optical telescopes went from two metres class to eight metre class telescopes, uh, tremendous discoveries were made. And they were made in the first few years, usually, of operating a new telescope. Uh, so for example, the last time we had a huge leap in telescope size, uh, we, it was about 30 years ago, and we discovered extrasolar planets uh, outside our solar system, we discovered the black hole, supermassive black hole in the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. And we also discovered, uh, as Brian Schmidt knows well, the fact that the universe is accelerating and that there's the existence of something which we don't know much about called dark energy. Now we're going to make a similar leap. So we're going to make a leap in telescope size both in space, on ground, in the optical, as well as in the radio. And they're all going to happen at around the same time. So this is, is pretty unprecedented in astrophysics. And so it starts off with James Webb Space Telescope, which has been launched and are already uh, ha making major progress with that telescope in particular and our understanding of galaxy formation evolution, as well as our understanding of extrasolar planets and what's in their atmospheres. We recently detected the first carbon dioxide in an extrasolar planet. Um, so that's a planet outside our solar system. Soon, the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to come online. That's in around 2024, and it's going to conduct a massive survey. It's going to actually image the entire sky uh, every three nights, and it's going to produce tremendous amounts of data sets. It's going to be amazing for uh, science of what we call time domain astronomy, so things that go bump in the night, supernova, gamma ray bursts, any, anything that basically changes with time. Supermassive black holes and galaxies also change quickly with time. We're then going to have the Roman Space Telescope. This is primarily designed for understanding extrasolar planets and their atmospheres, but we'll be doing other science as well. I'm going to be talking a bit about the Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope project, which we're leading at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And the extremely large ground-based optical telescopes, these are uh, 20 to 30 meter class telescopes which are currently being built. In particular, the European EELT is going to come online in 2028 to 2029, and that is well underway. Uh, we have then the Square Kilometre Array, which I'll talk a lot about in my talk, and the Square Kilometre Array low version is going to be in Australia. And then we have other experiments as well, including the next generation very large array in the US, and then the cosmic microwave background next experiment called S4, and that's in Antarctica. And so one of the things that we need to really do as Australians is we need to be ready for these missions. Oh, let's see if I can go back. So we need to be ready with our data, and we need to be ready with our surveys. I'm trying to go back, but it doesn't seem to want to click at all. The AV people, do I point it here? There's another one. Let's see if that works. There we are. Okay, so that's good. And can I go back? Yes, good. Okay, so 
you know, as Australians, we actually have to be ready. We need to, all the countries are getting ready right now for these next generation telescopes. So we need to hit the ground running. Uh, and, and that means years of preparation for these telescopes. It means getting your teams ready, building up the data sets. We need to know what to look at right away as soon as the telescopes have first light. Uh, we need to have our theoretical models ready. We need to have the predictions in hand and then the models need to be ready uh, to adapt when the observations turn out not exactly what we expected with our observations. And now in astronomy, we're using supercomputers for it all. So the data analysis as well as the theoretical simulations. And so this is an experiment, the Cosmic Microwave Background Experiment, uh, which is being, it's just been funded. It's going to be built in uh, Antarctica and is going to be measuring primordial gravitational waves and as well as uh, mapping the dark matter and the dark energy. And so this is going to be coming online in about a decade and um, currently being built at the moment. And so this is a, a tremendous advance in the previous cosmic microwave background experiments, which were basically doing um, maps. This is going to be much higher resolution. And then one thing that we've been leading at the Centre for Astrophysics is the study of supermassive black holes, in particular our nearby black holes in the centre of our own Milky Way, as well as uh, in our neighbouring galaxy, M87. And so the way we uh, measured this image of the black hole was by connecting radio telescopes around the world and by making an image uh, of the black hole. So this is an image of the black hole. The, the circle in the middle, the black circle in the middle, is the black hole, and that's the event horizon. And so from these types of images, we can understand a lot about black holes, including their mass. Uh, we can also hope to understand about the gas and the material that's falling into the black hole. And so this, is, this required five petabytes of data, and this has been taken across telescopes all over the world. And what, one thing that really limits us in astronomy is actually the data transfer uh, speeds or ability to transfer data around the world and also from space. And in particular with this experiment, we simply couldn't transfer the data from the telescopes whenever it was taken. They had to be written down into disks and then um, sent over on aeroplanes. And so for some parts of the world, like uh, Greenland, for example, it can take a little bit of a little while for your data to actually get to you before you can correlate all the data from the different radio telescopes. And the correlators itself needs to be done on supercomputing facilities. And so we're looking at expanding this project and in particular the blue points up there are where we currently have radio telescopes and the red points are where we'd like to have more radio telescopes. And what we want to do is instead of just having a map of the black hole and the gas around it, we want to make movies. We want to be able to watch the gas falling into the black hole. And what that will do is it's going to be able to tell us about uh, the spin of the black holes. It'll tell us more about the mass of the black holes and we're hoping it'll tell us also about how the black hole interacts with the surrounding material um, within in their bigger galaxies. Um, what we're getting, the types of data rates we're going to be um, using is 256 gigabits per second. And so that actually requires uh, new back-end technology on the radio telescopes themselves. And so we're currently putting in a National Science Foundation, pr Foundation proposal in order to build that new technology. And then we're also doing a reuse, re reduce and recycle in astronomy. So we're actually reusing radio telescopes uh, that were from old arrays, such as this array here. This is called BIMA. And uh, we're then redeploying them around the world as part of our, our larger VLBI array. Okay, and another experiment I mentioned earlier is the Vera Rubin Observatory. So this is an observatory that's going to come online the next, next year. And it's going to image the sky every three nights. Uh, it's basically going to have 20 terabytes of data coming in each night. This is really a, a tremendous challenge for us. The first data release is going to require processing of uh, 150 teraflops. And then once all the data is collected over 10 years, it'll be 950 teraflops required to process the data. And, you know, it's an enormous amount of data. We want to be able to analyse all the data. You need all the statistics from all the types of targets that this is going to be looking at. And so this is a major challenge for us in, a, in many different ways, including the processing of the data, then the analysis of the data. So we're not going to be able to analyse data in the way that we've been doing in the past. And in addition, our space telescopes are also challenging our um, 
you know, data needs. And in particular for space telescopes, we're really limited by the downlink speeds. And that's one area that we're actually investing in research uh, at our centre. So we uh, built one of the instruments on this Parker Solar Probe called SWEEP. It's a tiny little circular thing right at the top there. And what it does is it's not protected. It basically just measures um, the ionizing particles coming out of the sun. And this helps us understand more about space weather and is really important to us because we've got other satellites out there which are really affected by space weather. So we have an X-ray satellite uh, called Chandra, which we have to turn off sometimes because of, of space storms produced by the ionizing uh, particles from the sun and so we don't have very good models of this and these type of I instruments and the data we get from this tells us more about how to model space weather and then we need to be able to predict it so that we can uh, turn off or move our space satellites uh, when there's going to be major weather events in space. We also have recently gotten into climate science so astrophysicists typically didn't do climate science. We're looking out into space and not looking down into the Earth, but this has just recently changed. Uh, we have atomic and molecular physicists who've been looking at atmospheres and extrasolar planets and atmospheres of planets within our solar system, but this time we're looking at our own Earth's atmosphere. And so I'm really excited to say we recently launched, uh, in fact, in April, we launched a satellite called TEMPO. And TEMPO is a pollution monitor. Uh, it's just been turned on. Data is, is just started coming in. And so it's currently in commissioning phase. And so this satellite, um, it was a, a unique collaboration. It was launched on a SpaceX rocket. It's on an Intel communications satellite. So it's piggybacking on, on top of this satellite and at the same time monitoring the pollution across the US. And it's gonna have unprecedented rev resolution uh, of suburban scales, so it's about, um, well now I'm thinking in miles, it's, it's four by six miles. Um, and so it's basically, you can go outside your workplace or outside your school, and you'll have an app on your phone and you'll be able to see what the pollution is there, and you'll be able to go to a different suburb and then see what the pollution is there. You might go out to a factory and measure it there. It'll be great for classes and journalists in particular. Um, hourly monitoring, so what we really wanna do is to also be able to model the flow of pollution and, and where it goes once it is being produced. And in particular, we're looking at ozone aerosols and nitrogen dioxide. And then next year, we're launching a satellite called MethaneSat, which is uh, gonna monitor methane, similar resolutions, uh, hourly also, and this is a, a joint project with the Environmental Defence Fund as well as NASA, as well as the Smithsonian. Okay, so all of these types of data sets, in particular the ground-based uh, radio data sets, as well as the, uh, some of the ground-based optical data sets as well, we can't analyse them at the moment with our current setups. What we have to do is have the data sitting on various data archives and then we need to be able to access that data and keep it on those archives. But we need to be able to analyse it, search through it, make the figures and, and, and do the correlations, find the trends in the data. It has to be all done on the cloud, on the supercomputers. We, we just can't do it on our laptops or our desktops anymore. And in fact, the only thing we'll be able to do is basically download the final product, which will be the figures that we then use to produce the publications. And so what's really important to us right now and what we're working on at the Centre for Astrophysics is the middleware. So data handling, data analysis, all being done on the cloud. And then what type of software that looks like to the astronomers uh, when, when they're trying to access that data. And, we, and it's not just one type of data. We want to be able to access various different wavelengths. So X-ray, optical, infrared, radio data, as well as the theoretical simulations data, which is producing similar amounts of um, data sets at the moment. And so the Square Kilometre Array, now I'm gonna move closer to home. The Square Kilometre Array has actually been a major driver towards exascale uh, internationally as well as nationally. And so a lot of the, the movement now in supercomputing facilities in specific countries that are partners of the SKA is towards being able to handle the SKA type data. 
For example, this is uh, a, a publication about the SURF Virtual Data Centre for Processing, and this is based in the Netherlands, and the plan for this is specifically to be able to uh, handle the SKA-type data sets. And it has this, this type of infrastructure up there, so it's, um, it's sort of a stacked uh, data structure. There's also other publications talking about um, you know, what we're going to need to do for the Square Kilometre Array, and in particular the University of Cape Town, so this is South Africa, they've got the other part of the Square Kilometre Array, they've got the High Frequency Square Kilometre Array, array being built there, and uh, they also need to have a data centre to be able to process the High Frequency Square Kilometre Array data sets. And in France, there's a, a collaboration across multiple different universities, which are also looking at square kilometre array um, supercomputing and what's going to be needed in the exascale era. And in particular, they have a simulation tool, which uh, allows us to, to be able to analyse um, simulated data uh, through these various systems. And then right here in Australia, there's a lot of work being done and has been done over the past several years now. Uh, in particular, Kath Trott and her team at the ICRA and uh, Curtin University uh, in Western Australia. And so they work on the PAUSI supercomputing facility. So everything I'm going to talk about with the Square Kilometre Array is based on PAUSI. And so there's, there's a wide range of science cases. And in fact, there's so many science cases for the Square Kilometre Array that it is a 135 chapter book with 2,000 pages. You can download it and it will be excellent nighttime reading on what great science the Square Kilometre Array is going to do. And it covers things like galaxy formation and evolution, uh, strong field tests of gravity using black holes, and the origin and evolution of magnetism and uh, probing the cosmic dawn. So this is when the universe was very young. It entered a, a, period, a period of darkness and then the first stars uh, then lit up the universe. And when that, those first stars lit up the universe, they reionized the universe. And this is the period that the square kilometre array low, which is going to be based in Perth and Western Australia, is specifically designed to do. And it's one of the major science cases of the square kilometre array. And in particular, uh, we're actually looking at a period which is very close to the Big Bang. And so it's the period here which is just after that black stripe there. So just after 100 million years after the Big Bang. So this is a short period of time in terms of the universe. The universe is 13.7 billion years old. So it's an infant universe. And we're really looking at when the first stars and the first galaxies formed, which is between 100 to 250 million years just after the Big Bang. And to, to look that deep in the universe, look back in time, uh, we really, you need to go very, very sensitive. It's a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. And because in between us and the epoch of reionization there is an enormous amount of galaxies and gas. We have to remove that from the signal. And then we have to remove uh, interference from our own Earth, such as from satellites, um, microwaves, for example, produce interference. Uh, mobile phones and mobile phone towers. And we also have to uh, take off the, the effect from our own sky and our atmosphere and ionosphere in particular. And so this is a very detailed experiment and over the last few years we have been uh, simulating how we're going to analyse that data and using in particular pathfinders such as the Murchison Widefield Array to, to be able to um, produce data that we can test our, our processing on. Now, just a little bit of background about radio telescopes. I'm going to be talking about baselines and then the needs, the computing needs for the square kilometre array. So a radio telescope array, it's, it's like a very large dish. So the, the, lar the larger the distance between the telescopes, which is called baselines, uh, the larger your simulated telescope is. But it's got holes, right? Because you, you don't have a, you're not going to have a square kilometre huge telescope. It's actually a whole bunch of antenna. And so the more antenna you have, the more complete your image is and the cleaner it is and the more holes you have, the messier the image is. And so with the square kilometre array, it's going to look like this. We have, we're gonna, it's going to have all these different stations that are circular like this. And each of those little white points within that circle are antenna and um, they create a dipole. And so there's actually 512 stations like this in the square kilometre array and there will be 256 dipoles randomly distributed like in within this circle in each of these stations. 
And so that means that the number of baselines, so the number of uh, telescopes with which we have to correlate data is 130,000. And so that's pretty huge. And the array is going to look much like that. So we have uh, a lot of these um, stations in the center and then around this, fairly well scattered around that. And that's because we need lots of different baselines in order to produce different resolutions. So baseline is related to resolution. The larger the baseline, uh, the, the larger your simulated telescope is, and then you collect more photons. And so that means you, got, you can get higher resolution, you're more sensitive. If you have a short baseline, then uh, you're simulating a smaller telescope, but you can have a wider field of view. And so it's a trade-off. And so this is uh, what we have within these circles is we are dividing that within, within that we have more circles. And in those tiles, we have 16 antenna. And each of these circles of the whole station is about 65 metres across. And the distance between the antenna is at least one and a half metres. And so you can imagine this scattered across the Perth desert. It's actually pretty, pretty gigantic. And the re there's a very special reason for doing it this way, and it's really clever. And it's to do with beam steering. So with a normal telescope array where you've got t radio telescopes and you actually move them to point at things, they create a beam like this, and, and the beam is pointing towards your target, and there's side lobes coming off there, and uh, so you steer the telescope to look at different things. We're not doing that with a square kilometre array. It's going to be a phased array. It's a very, very clever approach. It's more like radar arrays that um, Defence has been using for many years. And you can beam steer with a phased array, a fixed phased array, in software. And so if you add a weight to each of these antenna the data coming from each of these antenna, you add a weight to it and you use matrix methods, you can actually beam steer the telescopes in different directions. You can then take different antenna and steer them to different parts of the sky. And that's a really cool part of this array. And so, and that's one reason why it's been designed like this with this specific setup with these specific circles and circles within circles because what that means is that we can tailor our resolution and we can tailor our baselines uh, towards whatever target we're looking at. Some targets you're going to need high resolution, sometimes you actually need to do a wide field of view. And we'll be able to look at different targets at the same time in different parts of the sky with the same array. And it's a bit like that image right at the top right there, um, it has oranges and, and limes and I think they're lemons as well. And so if you can imagine you take the oranges and you point them at one part of the sky, you want to look at um, you know, a, a certain type of galaxy, and then you, you take the, the limes and you point them at a different part of the sky because you want to look at different galaxies. And so that's the sort of flexibility that we're going to be able to have with the square kilometre array. So it means you're actually multiplying the amount of science you'll be able to do in the same amount of time. Can't do that with most telescopes at the moment. Uh, however, if we can do that, that increases the amount of compute time needed. And so with each, each station, we've got these randomised uh, configurations of 256 dipoles, and we can average out the images from each of those stations. And, but to do that, we actually need to know how each of those stations is responding to the sky. And the, that's uh, part of the, the simulations that's being done at the moment, is the simulations of the ionosphere and what it's actually doing to what we observe with each of these um, simulated square kilometre array stations. And so different stations are gonna see different parts of the sky and the sky's moving. And th these simulations are over 74 minutes. And so it is moving over that time frame. So we're actually gonna have to be subtracting that off before we correlate the data from the different stations. And so that adds to the, the computer power required in order to analyze the data. And so what do we actually need? Well, we've got 256 randomized dipoles in, in uh, a station, and then we've got 262,000 channels and two polarizations, and then you multiply that by the, the number of, of stations. You've got 130,000 baselines, and that's just if, you, if you're just using the array to look at one thing. If you're using it to look at many different targets, you would have up to 3.3 million baselines. And so this means that we have, we, the data needs are 10 to the 17 bytes an hour, so 100 uh, petabytes an hour is what's going to be produced. And that will be on for six to eight hours 
at a time, so we're getting hundreds uh, up to a thousand petabytes a night. And uh, so there's, and that's just the incoming data. We then need to process that, so we need to time average the data, we need to do frequency averaging, we've got to flag out bad data within that, and then we have to uh, subtract off the sky model, the telescope model, and the beam models for the telescope. So it's, it's dramatic. And so the, the needs for radio astronomers in Australia um, are really high. It's, it's, based, it's basically large data rates. Uh, we need to be able to compress the data without losing uh, key information in the data. And then we, we want to have a dynamic and flexible definition of the telescope. We want to be able to do this beam steering and be able to look at different targets at the same time or to be able to adjust the telescope resolution based on what our, our need is for the, for the targets. And so this means it's really challenging for, for the data rates and the data handling. And uh, this is, is just active, ongoing research at the moment. And then we need to be able to predict the data as well. And so this is work that's been done uh, within the Astro 3D Centre of Excellence. And in, in particular, we're looking at galaxy formation evolution simulations and starting at the Big Bang, just after the Big Bang at the Epoch of Reionization, and then following those simulations forwards in time to model even galaxies like our own Milky Way. And the unique thing about these data sets is that we have theorists working embedded with observers, and so we're able to produce mock data sets. In fact, we've got some of the people producing the mock data sets up there. And uh, so the mock data sets are what we can do, we, how we directly compare the theoretical models with the, with the observations. And so here's an example of the simulations to predict the epoch of reionization. So on the right there is a, a cube. This is a cube of the universe at the epoch of reionization. This has been done on the pausey. Uh, sorry, not on the pausey, on NCI. And the red is the neutral hydrogen, and it's actually... It's being ionised, so the electrons are being ripped off the atoms, and what you see there is the stars, the new stars, that have produced the ionising radiation that rips off the electrons from the atoms. So it looks like Swiss cheese for a while, very, very dense, opaque universe, and then over 100 million years or so, you start to see more and more holes due to the, the gas becoming, hydrogen gas becoming ionised, and then you have a transparent universe. And so the square kilometre array aims to map this and map it in 3D. And I, I can't emphasise how important this is for astronomy. It would be the first time we've ever been able to e detect, let alone map, the epoch of reionisation. There's a Nobel Prize right there. We need to have the data power here and the processing power here in Australia to be able to do it. And then we have to, after, we've, after we get those data cubes with the simulations, we have to then simulate what we're actually going to observe. We, we don't observe the cube. We, we look, we see a single line of sight or, a, or a, a map, essentially, and we're integrating along that line of sight. So you're summing up the data. And so this, this here simulates what it might look like as we're looking at it from one of our telescopes. And so and this is important simulations being done at the moment. And then um, one thing we need to do is improve the resolution of the simulation. So Square Kilometre Array actually doesn't have as good a resolution for looking at things like galaxies in the early universe as the James Webb Space Telescope does, but we want to be able to use both data sets, and so we need to improve the resolution of the simulations. And in particular, what we're doing at the moment, you'd like to be able to run the, resolution, the simulations with the resolution we need, but uh, we can't, we don't have the supercomputing power to do it. And so what we're doing is we're combining, we're basically doing a, 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 a augmented simulation. So we're combining Monte Carlo merger trees, which have been calculated using a different simulation, into um, these, these n-body simulations to produce a resolution which is equivalent to about 10,000 cube particles. And then... Uh, that allows us to then simulate at the top uh, the type of resolution we would see with the James Webb Space Telescope and at the bottom with the square kilometre array. These are different wavelengths. So on the bottom we've got uh, radio and at the top this is a rest frame optical uh, or rest frame, in, rather in, rest frame infrared. It's observed infrared actually, it's not rest frame. And then we can zoom in, we need to be able to zoom in. 
And then finally, some of the great things that are being done at the moment with the uh, supercomputing simulations, and this has also been done on NCI. Um, this is one of the first Australasian leadership uh, supercomputing grants, and it was specifically to try to image, uh, to try to model jets uh, coming from supermassive black holes within the centres of galaxies within their big broader cluster environment, so clusters of galaxies, and see the impact of a supermassive black hole. Uh, from even outside that galaxy and the impact on, on potentially other galaxies around it. Never been done before and so it actually was a combination of, of cluster and body simulations as well as magneto-hydrodynamic simulations of the jet coming out of the black hole. And in particular the production of mock observations which are the shown in the two right hand side there what we expect to be observing uh, from these types of jets and these these are going aiming to model what we expect to see with the square kilometer array um, of jets coming from supermassive black holes in galaxies and so the takeaways from the square kilometer array uh, that you know it's a 2.2 billion dollar project and we've got half of it here in Australia the square kilometer array low array and, you know, we want to be able to make the discoveries here in Australia. And it, it's, this is a tremendous instrument for, for Australia. It's, it's tremendous for business, for industry, the building of it, uh, the development of it. And then, but they require supercomputing facilities that are able to handle 600 to 800, um, you know, petabytes per night. And so our SKA office that we have here is only one of many SKA offices uh, that are around the world. The data become available to everybody at the same time. And so we're not alone in wanting to process the data really quickly. Everybody's going to be trying to process this data. And so I, I think we risk losing, you know, these discoveries that are being done on our own soil if our compute power isn't sufficient enough. So, you know, I'm a, a huge proponent of more government funding into our supercomputing facilities as well as more industry funding and collaborations uh, for our supercomputing facilities. Uh, it's fundamentally important for Australia. And then similarly with our, with our predictions, our theoretical models, we have the teams, we've got the models being developed and then we just need to have world-class exascale supercomputing facilities in order to be able to produce the predictions and then test them against the observations when they come available from the square kilometre array. And then finally, I just want to uh, finish up by talking about something completely different, diversity. Um, we've heard already today that uh, big teams, we need big teams in exascale, both for big data, obtaining big data, but also uh, large simulations. They all require big teams. We had a big team in Astro 3D, 300 uh, members, and we, we had a goal of, of reaching 50-50. So 50% women and 50% men, where, where when I say women and men, I'm referring to people who identify as women and men. And the goal was to do that in four years, and we did do that. It's achievable, and it's not through targeted hires. We didn't do it through women-only positions. We did it through uh, evidence-based methods around hiring and retention. And I'm going to show you how we did that. And the top right figure there, the blue line, is our overall fraction of women. But in particular, our women postdocs, uh, we achieved 56% and then 55% women students as well. And we started with a top-down approach. So this is the beginning of the centre, what our what our executive committee looked like. And so we started with a diverse committee. So as directors, you can choose who your executive team is. You can choose who is on your advisory board. You know, you get to choose this. Choose a diverse team. I'll show you, it's really important. And then we just did evidence-based methods. So anything that, that was in the literature, proven, uh, ideally with, with randomised double-blind trials, uh, to show that it improves applicants from a diverse pool and that you get success rates when you make offers, uh, we, we applied within the centre. And so in particular, uh, we used 50-50 on our search committees. We did 50-50 on our shortlists. But then we did not tell anybody who they had to hire. They hired the best person after that. And uh, we had 50-50 search committee chairs. Okay, and then within that, those constraints, we hired the best candidates. That's how we got 53% uh, women in four years. That's all. And the committee was had mandatory and tr implicit bias training. This is across nine universities. And so it was, and in the postdoc pool, 40 postdocs. So this is 
statistically significant and so we applied exactly the same method across those nine universities. Uh, what we also found was when we looked at which positions had been advertised and which weren't advertised, we achieved 50% in the advertised positions but not in the non-advertised positions. So in the beginning of the centre we had some positions where, where an investigator would say, well, we've already got someone here who can do that, can I hire that person? We'd say yes. And it turns out when we looked at the data after the four years that when, when that happened, we hired 86% men, 14% women, whereas when we advertised and we, we had the 50-50 shortlist search committees, search committee chairs, we hired 50-50. Really big difference. And I need to point out that the applicant pool was 32% women. And, you know, we, I'm, I often hear you should be hiring at the rate of the percentage of women in your applicant pool. Not true. That's a false assumption. That assumes that the persistence of men and women in the field is similar and it, it, it's drawn from the same distribution. When you think about persistence in astronomy in Australia, um, we've shown in publications that women have been leaving it at larger rates than men. Those women that are leaving the field have not been drawn randomly from the distribution. Okay, the, the ones that are remaining in the field are the ones who feel they're good at the field. And so it's not the same. You do not have the same group of people in that 32% as you have in that 68%. And that's about persistence. You cannot make assumptions about persistence in the pool. So setting up a 50-50 uh, shortlist is fine because they have different persistence rates. Uh, what we also found afterwards was that when we looked at the fraction of, of men and women hired by team leads, so we've purposely set up the team leads to be 50% uh, men and 50% women, when we looked at who hired who, we had more women being attracted to and recruited by the women-led teams and more men being attracted to and recruited by the men-led teams. This is both for students as well as for postdocs. And so that just really highlights the importance of diverse leadership. Uh, and then we wanted to retain our, our people that we'd recruited. If, you, if you're going to go to all that effort to recruit a diverse pool, you need to retain them. And so I don't have time to go through all of this in my talk, but these are all evidence-based as well. And uh, in particular, we had a values-based culture, family-friendly culture and uh, mentoring programs, various types of diversity training, uh, and, and all jobs available part-time, various codes of conduct. Really strong focus on building a positive and inclusive culture. And then what we found after those, uh, after five years, when we looked at the retention rates, so the students and postdocs that were hired or, or came to us in 2017, uh, we retained more women and similarly from the ones that came in 2018. So more women were retained than men. So this shows that these methods work evidence-based methods that are already based out there in the literature, it works. You can achieve 50% through your hiring and you don't need to go to extreme lengths and you don't need to do uh, necessarily women-only hires. Uh, so the takeaways from the diversity is that as a, as a country, we're a small population compared to the rest of the world and we can draw from the international pool. And we should be drawing from the international pool, even in niche fields. You're hiring one person work hard to get applications from around the world. And we can achieve our diversity targets, even in niche fields. And some of the ones we were hiring were in really, really niche fields, you know, specific expertise required for radio telescopes, for example. Uh, and we know how to hire and retain a diverse workforce. Um, so I've, I've got this submitted at the moment to Nature Astronomy. And uh, diverse executive teams and diverse project leads are really fundamental in order to, to improve the diversity in your organisations. And then I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I just have... Um, I'm just very interested in the, in the last few slides that you presented. Uh, so, um, and in, in particular, the, the pie chart you showed of the applicant pool. Um, so, I, I know it's not the same thing. So, but, so for example, um, I think it was around two decades ago or more, so the Labor Party introduced a 30% quota for um, uh, females in 
um, winnable uh, pre-selection seats. Um, and um, uh, as a result of that, that quota, they've, they've now achieved a, a 50%, uh, approximately 50% representation in Parliament over that time. Um, so um, I'm just wondering, sort of, is there, is there like a, a critical number, uh, sort of around that 30% yes. level? Um, yes, there is. So we found a tipping point at around 40%. So once our overall uh, proportion of women reached 40%, um, we found that the number of women students coming into... It was actually constant before that, the fraction of women students, and then it, it shot right up in the space of a year or two and uh, then ended up above 50%, it's like 56, 60% at the moment. And so we think that there was a tipping point. Um, so there's, there's actually theoretical models of these tipping points in populations, and the theoretical models is sociology, uh, journal articles that these are in, and they say the tipping point's around 37%, and we found it was roughly around that, it's around 40%. So there is a tipping point, and I think in organisations you just have to achieve 40%, and then it's sort of easy. Uh, so just quickly, so that, that 30%, would you say that's reflective of the overall distribution of the field, or is that more at sort of the, the mid to early career yeah, so stage? Yeah, so 30% reflects overall the field. So um, currently PhD students in Australian astronomy are graduating at the 30% rate. And, and then they drop off through the, you know, as they get more senior. And so at the senior levels, you know, some universities it's still around 10, 15%. Others is better. On the storage and computing side, I mean, you talked about the SKA of 600 petabytes a night. We have to compress that data yes. because we can't store it all. Yes. Historically in astronomy, we've had an enormous amount of science, discovery, generic science, all around that has come from archival data. And it's been an incredible resource for us. But in an era where we won't be able to save everything, especially in the radio, I suspect you might know more on ELT optical side, that may also be true. What are the implications for potential future discovery limitations or future archival-based work? Yeah, I, like it's tremendously disappointing that we won't be able to keep that data because as we know from astronomy in the past and the, the data that has been archived, um, data, people, astronomers have gone back and analysed data, you know, really quite old data. In fact, people are going back and analysing the digitising. We have photographic plates from Harvard, you know, from, from hundreds of years ago, and we're now digitising those, and they're being used for astronomical studies, you know, supernova that, that went off you know, hundreds of years ago. And it's a great resource being able to have that data. And when you have new methods of being able to analyse the data, like we weren't able to digitise those plates before. It was great that they were kept. I mean, lots were destroyed, but there's still enough that's been kept that we can now digitise it and use that data. And I, I think it's, it's, it's a tragedy that we can't keep the raw data because as we progress 30 years down the track, 40 years down the track, I bet our methods of processing the data and removing the noise from the data will be so much better that we might be able to detect signals in there 30 years down the track that we can't detect today. And so, you know, we ought to be trying to store that data. We can't. We don't, we don't, don't have the ability right now. But, but I really wish we could. The data compression is incredibly important and we want to have more research in that. Please join me in thank Lisa for her presentation.